In the fall of 1829, Grimke resolved to leave Charleston and the pollutions of slavery for an uncertain future in the North. There's a kind of fearlessness about Angelina Grimke. Women did not strike out. White women did not strike out on their own in this way. And Southern white women certainly did not. She moved to Philadelphia and joined her like-minded sister, Sarah. There, Angelina discreetly followed reports of the abolitionist movement. She was reluctant to get involved, fearing that would bring disgrace to her mother back in Charleston. But as she read reports of the rising tide of pro-slavery violence, Grimke finally decided that she could remain silent no more. Scores of abolitionists descended on New York for a training session, as did Angelina and Sarah Grimke. Angelina's head was turned by a striking young theologian who ran most of the sessions. Theodore Weld had committed himself totally to the anti-slavery cause. He trains them, teaches them, and sends them off to give talks. Of course, since they're women, to speak in front of a mixed, or as they called it, promiscuous audience of men and women was absolutely forbidden. The abolitionists are ardent desirers of respectability for their movement. So when men start to come to her talks, their antenna go up. And when they tell her to stop talking to men, she says, no, I have a right. As the arguments escalated, Angelina began linking the rights of enslaved people to the rights of women. But Weld did not. Women's rights should not be your preoccupation, he told Angelina, at least not until the slaves are free. Grimke's pain and anger came through in her reply. Can't you just stand here side by side with us? Can you not see that women could do and would do a hundred times more for the slave if she were not shackled. Angelina wrote to Theodore, saying she hadn't realized how much he disliked her. And he writes back to her, you're young and you have too much pride and you're not helping the cause. And then in great big letters, three times the size of the rest of the letter, he writes, I have loved you from the first moment I met you. In the spring of 1838, Angelina and Theodore's friends received a wedding invitation adorned with an engraving of a slave in chains. The couple improvised their vows, denounced a man's authority over his wife, and to cap it all off, they had a black minister and a white minister lead the congregation in prayer. Angelina moved with Theodore to a rustic farm in New Jersey. There, they would take up their most influential work. American Slavery As It Is was a book made up of first-hand accounts of slavery, handbills for runaway slaves, court records, and the words of slave owners themselves. A mammoth undertaking. It was an irrefutable answer to the argument that slavery was a necessary and benevolent institution. Grimke was unflinching in her own account. I saw slavery in the city, among the fashionable and the honorable. I have known the mistress of a family to borrow servants to wait on company because their own slaves had been so cruelly flogged that they could not walk without limping at every step, and their putrefied flesh emitted such an intolerable smell that they were not fit to be in the presence of company. American Slavery As It Is became the best-selling book in the country. Angelina Grimke never surrendered the vision of a more perfect society in which black and white men and women walk together in the ways of God. <laughs>